Welcome. I'm, I'm sorry it's standing room only, but it suggests the enthusiasm for this event. And my name is Andrew Morris. I'm director of HDR UK. On behalf of our, our, our colleagues and our partners across UKRI, uh, the Office of Life Sciences, MRC Innovate, and many NHS and charity partners, it's my huge pleasure to welcome you here today, but also to congratulate you, because you're part of a, an outstanding team that we think are going to do outstanding things across the UK. So congratulations, welcome, but I'm afraid the work starts today. Um, I should also congratulate you on finding the attic. Um, <laughs> Um, this is Tavistock House, as you know, the home of the BMA. I don't know if you knew that this is where Charles Dickens lived as well for nine years, 1851 to 1860. And he wrote arguably the best-selling novel of all time, A Tale of Two Cities, in this very room. So you're in a very, very distinguished uh, 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 company. So A Tale of Two Cities, I sort of read, in, uh, read into it. As you know, it was about a doctor, which is appropriate. He was a, a French guy called Manet. And it portrayed a world that was on fire, split between Paris and London, <laughs> during a brutal and bloody events. So I thought, how, how appropriate in the, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, the current, um, in the current environment. But today is an important first step in our quest to build a world-leading, robust and trustworthy health data research infrastructure for the UK. Because if we do this right and we work in partnership, ideally we should be able to, uh, with public support, run studies on up to 66 million people. And we need to if we're going to improve outcomes. I would argue there's a sense of urgency about this. Who reads the Telegraph? Anyone reads the Telegraph? Mm -hmm. You're all in denial. <laughs> so, but on the, on the front page of the Telegraph today, there's a, a story about our revival times. And the facts are that if you live in Australia and develop uh, uh, pancreatic cancer, you've got a 15% chance of survival in five years' time. It's 8% in the UK, so about half less in the UK, so about half less. When I develop lung cancer, you have a 22% chance of survival in five years' time. In the UK, it's 15%. So we're lagging behind. And as we know, today's research is tomorrow's treatment, and we need to use data. The best-performing health systems internationally are characterized by whole system intelligence, tracking journeys of care of patients across primary, secondary, tertiary, and now social care, but also the ability to use the same data to improve and research. And that's what this is about. It's about care, it's about patient journeys, it's about survival, it's about quality. So thank you for joining this. Someone said that without using data, it's like driving at night with no headlights. And I think those days should be gone in the 21st century. So what the team are gonna to do today is work with you to set out the foundation for what we want to be outstanding, working in partnership with the NHS, the public and others to create a UK uh, health data research infrastructure. So our vision, as you know, and um, I must say HDR UK is very privileged and honoured to be able to convene this. It's not our program, it's your program. But we're, we're looking forward to working in partnership so that we can unite the UK's health data to enable discoveries to improve patients' lives. Wouldn't it be great to stand up in five years' time and to look at those cancer survival rates and say that actually we've improved them? I'm looking at data can here as the, <laughs> as the opportunity. We've, we're doing this in partnership. The NHS can't do it themselves. Academia can't. Industry can't. The charities can't. So this has to be a collaboration, arguably on a scale that we haven't seen before. And we need to see a convergence of care and research and use data science, and that's the convergence of math, statistics, computational science, and domain knowledge for change. But most importantly, with big data goes big responsibilities. So we need to do this on an absolute foundation of trust. We need to be honest, we need to be reliable, we need to be competent, and we need to be transparent. So I'm just I'm delighted that our public team are on the, the front row who've actually guided us 
and held us to account as we developed this, this, this program. Where this all started, as you know, the UK government is, is, is very much uh, behind this program, and can we credit OLS, John Bell, uh, Mark Walport, UKRI for their leadership and vision. Um, it has its origins in the industrial strategy. We were asked to lead this program about 12 months ago, and I hope we're going to try and convince you today that we've done a lot in 12 months, pulling this community together. This is about people, not technology. So, and Caroline will outline uh, where we uh, currently are. So since last September, we've been listening because um, the, the easiest thing we could have done would have had the classical competition and created seven silos on an already complex landscape, all doing their own thing and all sitting in competition <coughs> with each other. So a clear message from today is seven hubs, one program, one community. We need to do this together if we're going to scale across the UK. But Jerry Riley individually claims he spoke to 2,700 people. <laughs> so he, uh, we'll see how many Christmas cards he gets this year. <laughs> but we did. We spoke to the publics, many organizations across NHS industry, academia, but also looked internationally at international best practice. Because if this is going to work, the UK needs to partner and collaborate internationally. We hosted 35 events, and we, we, we worked with industry to see what the, the needs and the opportunities for partnership by working with industry in a trustworthy way are. And can I thank the ABPI, the Pastoral Alliance, the Medicines Discovery Catapult, and many others for, for supporting us uh, in, in this listening phase. And what we heard is that the NHS patients and innovators need good health data resources. Currently, they're very difficult to access, and much data is of very poor quality. So there's a real difficulty in using and harnessing UK data. What people also want is what we call longitudinal, multimodal healthcare data. So how do we characterize journeys of care in terms of clinical events, but also other information, whether that's radiology information, molecular information, because only then will we understand the complex interface between clinical care, biology, and environment that will, will yield new insights. Most importantly, any work we do has to have benefit to patients in the NHS. Benefit to patients in the NHS, and we are committed to involving the public and patients throughout. So can I just highlight, this is, this is much wider, but our team, and I think they're all here today, so thank you for that. Uh, also other, uh, other uh, key friends and colleagues, uh, um, such as Ashling from the AMRC. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're learning how to do public engagement. We haven't perfected it yet, but we, we, we want to be held to account as we do this so that we focus on the patient, journeys of care, and how can we yield new knowledge and information. So can I thank you all for being here? Caroline's going to uh, take us through the detail. Can I thank you all also because many of you have been videoed and we're going to see some great videos later. So uh, we look forward to those. I was actually able to email Tom Hanks to say, <laughs> your next Oscar is not under threat. <laughs> so, but, we'll, but we'll do that. But I'm going to finish with Dickens, because his first lines of Tales of Two Cities, he said, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It could be 20, 20, uh, 2019 in the UK today. But what we want this program to be is to be characterized by being the best of times through partnership working, have a golden thread of wisdom and learning and belief, because this is, this is pretty ambitious for the UK, but let's see what we can achieve together. So thank you very much. I introduce Caroline, who's done all the work. Thank you, Andrew. For, um, I'm Caroline Cake. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Director at HDR UK. 
And building on the vision that Andrew has just set out, I'm going to give you an overview of the program, a UK-wide capability that will enable the safe and responsible use of health-related data at scale for research and innovation. And I'm also very excited to be sharing with you the key announcements for the program, so you can see how much has been achieved since we met at the launch on the 7th of May. So we have 18 members of the UK Health Data Research Alliance, seven health data research hubs, the Innovation Gateway, the Metadata Catalogue, and the Minimum Viable Product coming together, seven members of our user group, the Sandbox, and a roadmap that shows how we're going to be working together over the coming months. This is also a very nice opportunity to thank our fantastic colleagues from UKRI, NHSX, the Office of Life Sciences, our Public Advisory <coughs> Panel, and everyone who's helped us develop this programme. So the DIH programme has, um, has been designed to stimulate a new wave of innovation. As Andrew set out, there's a series of things from, we gathered a feedback of what people are wanting. And we're designing the programme to meet these needs. And this is all underpinned by building people's confidence and trust in how data is used. This is crucial and essential in everything we're doing. The Hub will be bringing benefits to everyone, to patients, industry, academic um, researchers, and will improve the way in which we're able to pre uh, prevent, detect, and diagnose diseases. And it will do this in the three key parts. So three parts of the program. The health, uh, UK Health Data Research Alliance, which it brings together the major data custodians to make data available for research and innovation. The health data research hubs, which are improving the quality of the data and making available expert um, services using the data. And the gateway, which provides a common access point for innovators and researchers. And this is all um, underpinned in combination by this need to demonstrate patient and public be benefit. So we help create a trustworthy um, use of the data. And I'm now going to take you through the major announcements um, and developments of the program and how these will contribute to a joined up UK wide offer for industry and researchers. So, starting with the Alliance. So, the Alliance is working in partnership with NHSX and with NHS organisations to um, support the adoption of open standards and to promote connectivity across technology in health and social care. So, it brings together the leading organisations who are custodians of data and their 18 current members and more expected to join in the, in the coming months. And the members include national bodies, so you'll see very familiar names on there. We're also delighted to have NHS trusts on, um, on board there, charities and research cohorts, and many of you are in the room today, so thank you very much for that. And the Alliance, going to, Alliance is going to be working together across five major work streams, which are critical areas for research and innovation. So firstly, around data standards and quality. Secondly, about improving and supporting the innovation gateway development improving participation and access um, uh, for, to the data, and building aligned approaches to trusted research environments, and very importantly in the centre here, engaging and involving practitioners, patients, and the public. Our new website for the Alliance has just gone live, so that's available for um, you to look at now, which sets out a, a great resource showing all the things happening with different members in that, so please do start using that, and um, thank you to the team for developing that for today. And on to the hubs. So the hubs um, are providing curated disease-focused data sets um, for clinical trials and real-world ev uh, real evidence. And their competition was launched in May, which many of you are at um, a launch of that, we're delighted that over 160 organizations across 21 consortia applied. So it's an incredible um, uh, coming together of different organizations on that. We had an expert panel who led the um, selection process, which was chaired by Lord Darcy. And it was an extremely difficult process. So thank you to all of the, everyone. There's a lot of work put in by everyone in terms of putting together the bids and actually a relatively fast and short time scale. And from that, seven hubs were selected. And I'm delighted to announce the seven hubs. So, yes, congratulations, everyone. <laughs> so we have Breathe, which is um, for respiratory health, led by um, Aziz Sheikh. Data Can, for cancer, led by Charlie Davey. Discover Now, for real-world evidence, by Axel Heipmuller. Uh, GI Know, for inflammatory bowel disease, being led by John um, Bradley. 
Insight uh, for eye health, uh, with um, being led by Alistair Denniston, and the Digi NHS Digi Trial for clinical trials, uh, by led by Martin Landry, and Pioneer for acute care, being led by Liz Sapi. So thank you for bringing together such fantastic teams across such a broad and uh, diverse and exciting area. The hubs are located across the UK in multiple locations, and this picture shows the extraordinary reach of each of the hubs in there. Each of those colours is a hub and shows the links of the different areas they're involved in and multiple specialisms. They're creating a new way of working in the UK, a way of working in partnership, um, sp uh, supporting research and innovation and learning from each other so that collectively we create the world's leading environment for health data research but they can tell you about it far better than I can. And so here is a short video. Um, so we've got a series of videos which are going through for each of the hubs, so I'll, I'll let them tell you the story themselves. We have collected information that's been provided by over 25,000 patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. They've given us a sample from which we can extract DNA. And what we will now be doing is also accessing their medical records with their permission from the hospitals that look after them. We'll bring all of that data together and make it available for researchers who want to use that to learn more about their disease and ultimately develop new treatments. At the moment there are over half a million people in the UK with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, everybody's experience is unique and unfortunately there doesn't seem to be a one-size-fits-all treatment for patients with Crohn's or colitis. The Hub offers a real opportunity for future treatments, particularly for young people. Being able to get on the, the best, most individual treatment for them as quickly as possible will make a real difference to their disease progression and also the things that they want to do in their life. So a big problem with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's disease and colitis, is the difficulty in predicting what's going to happen. What's going to be their disease course? Which treatments are they going to respond to? If you can avoid trialling a whole bunch of different therapies, many of which are very expensive and which are perhaps not going to work, but it actually goes straight to the one which is most likely to be successful, then that's going to be a good outcome both for the patients and of course for our health economy. Virtually everybody in the UK experiences a respiratory illness at some point in their lives. One in five of the population also has a long-term respiratory condition and at the moment our respiratory outcomes are substandard compared with many other high-income countries. So we need to do something that's dramatically different. about faster, more accurate access to data to all of the patient's information that allows people to make really educated decisions. It's about being able to identify patients who may be more likely to respond to a particular treatment. It's about being able to predict who's at higher risk of having a more aggressive disease uh, and potentially using some of the, the genetic predispositions that people have to disease to tailor treatments going forward. We're very keen to work in uh, close partnership with the other hubs that have been funded across the UK and other disease areas. Uh, we believe that if we can do that, what we will be able to do is not only transform uh, respiratory health, but we'll also be able to provide some really important exemplars of, of the power of data uh, to transform people's lives. One of the fantastic things so far for this hub has been working collaboratively with patients to understand exactly what their needs are. In the long term, we hope that this hub will provide the NHS with additional uh, information that they'll need that will directly help patients in their day-to-day -day lives. Our hub is focused on eye disease and the new science of oculomics. That's using our ultra-high resolution scanning systems to bring new insights into some of the most serious diseases of our time, things like diabetes and dementia.
In 2016, Moorfields Eye Hospital initiated a collaboration with Google DeepMind, which allowed us to develop an algorithm that could diagnose many of the commonest causes of blindness. With this hub, we want to share what we've learned from that experience on a national level. So based on big data, we're hoping that we'll be able to individualize for patients what treatment they need, when they need it. And that will be a true benefit in terms of vision outcomes and delivery of care. One thing that really attracted me to join this fantastic group of partners is the collective vision that we can all work together, making the data set available to a wider group of participants. And that means a lot of trust. Trust not only among the partners themselves, but actually all the patient data and that of the general population that will be collected will be handled in a safe and secure manner. The hub will have a very strong approach to data safety and security, and that will be founded on a number of principles. For the application of new technologies such as AI in healthcare to be successful, they have to put patients first. The transparency about the use of patient data has to be embedded at every stage of the process. Clinical trials are the bedrock of medicine. It's clinical trials that provide us the information we need as, as doctors about which treatments are safe and which treatments are effective. This new hub will allow clinical trials that are uh, richer, have better quality information, but are substantially less costly than the current trials. Recruiting participants for clinical trials is difficult. It could sometimes take months to get the lists of patients from an individual hospital. It could be used widely for clinical trials in the UK and make the UK an even better place to do research. The, the data we hold is in trust and we must make sure we keep that trust. And that means using the right governance, making sure we have the right controls in place, and that overall, the public are aware of what's happening, a policy of openness and transparency. We will also be partnering with the patient community to make sure that the new systems that we develop actually really meet the needs of patients, both patients in clinical trials and patients who might use the results from clinical trials. This hub will deliver high quality results better treatment for individual patients, better decisions about which treatments we should or should not use, and in due course, uh, better health for the population at large. Acute care is any unplanned healthcare contact. 110 million people per year seek acute care help. And the costs are huge, 17 billion pounds per year. But despite this huge burden and cost, Acute care has seen less healthcare innovation than any other area of healthcare. And we hope that by bringing together this data from different providers across the country, we can offer innovation that's never been seen before to really improve patients' lives. As a mobile population, we want to be able to access and to provide that information to clinicians at any point in time. This hub is not just a regional opportunity, it's a national opportunity to start taking the pressures off with CUTE, but also firmly placing the information into the hands of patients precisely where they should be. As a patient, I'm really excited about the creation of this new hub, speeding up processes and also helping patients in the future. It's really important that they have the patient involvement. We really want to make sure that uh, the compliance is there, uh, the security side of it. Working with the NHS, working with the practitioners in cyber security and in information technology, it starts to build a platform where patients can start believing and trusting where that data is set. And I think that is highly an important facet of the cell.
So this is a national cancer hub across the four countries of the United Kingdom and its purpose is to harness data so that we can improve access to trials, improve diagnosis and find the best treatments for cancer. We'll work in collaboration with patients, with charities, with the NHS, with scientists and with industry partners so that we can all work with one mission to beat cancer. The Hub will globally position the UK's unique health data ecosystem by combining de-identified clinical data with genomics data. This programme is going to use data to really drive an ecosystem within the UK. That ecosystem is going to give us more knowledge in relation to disease, but also use that knowledge for better outcomes for patients, but also to help drive innovation. Patients want their data to be used. In fact, they're surprised it's not used already. The work of the Hub and the new research it engenders will bring hope to the patients who are diagnosed every year from this awful disease. One in two people will get cancer in their lifetimes and this Hub offers the hope and opportunity of saving 30,000 lives a year. One of the major challenges in healthcare is that we end up treating disease rather than preserving health. This hub will take diverse data sets and information, bring those together to allow us to potentially help manage and monitor patients much more effectively. We're working with some of the best medical minds in the business some of the best technology minds in the business and as a collective group of people we can understand how to better manage and support patients with long-term conditions. The exciting thing for us is that we're already operational and we are doing lots of exciting research. We'll bring in new data sets, we'll open up national access to data, we'll work with partners to build a new exciting model which will enable access to that, we'll work with the public to ensure that they um, understand what we're doing more with, with data for research. We believe that building public trust is one of the most important priorities for the Hub, that through engagement, through involvement, through deliberation, through having a meaningful conversation with the public, we can work with them to co-design, co-develop, co-produce what this Hub looks like, therefore creating trust and confidence in the process and our work. One of our unique traits, I think, is the fact that we are not condition specific that by studying different patterns that occur before illness presents itself, what we'll be able to do is be in a position to prevent adverse health outcomes before they occur and to improve the health of Northwest London and eventually the UK. So, um, hugely exciting. And as Andrew said, this is the start. The hard work's all to come, but the, the goal is um, exciting, ambitious, and will benefit all of us. Um, and the next key part of the programme so, is the gateway. Um, the gateway, as I mentioned before, the common access um, point to the UK's health um, research data. And this will be bringing to together the data from the um, hubs um, and from the alliance and making it discoverable. So it's not holding data, it's making its um, data discoverable and um, accessible through that route. We're developing in two phases. The first phase is around developing a minimum viable product, which gets up the discovery and access portal um, established. And we um, have um, identified the partner for that and will be commencing on that um, in the next few days. The um, metadata catalogue then is being supported by NHS Digital and University of Oxford. And so the gateway is getting up and running and the aim is for the end of this, by the end of this year, beginning of next year, the first um, metadata will be discoverable through, um, through the platform. The phase two then will be starting in, in parallel to that and we'll be de developing the kind of the larger scale um, aspect of the gateway through a technology partnership and so you'll be hearing more announcements of that coming forward. 
And the fourth component I was just going to mention today was the sandbox. So it's very easy to develop um, various things in a, in a dark room and what you might think the users actually require. But what we really wanted to make sure is we really understood who the, what the user requirements are, were for, um, for data. And so we wanted to bring together a group of people who are genuine users and needing it from research and innovation. And so we put a call out um, over the summer to identify potential partners to help us on that. And um, I'm delighted to announce the seven organisations she selected through um, a panel and was wonderful to have help of our public advisory board and NHSX in, in identifying these users. So these, these organisations each has a, a research need and innovation requirement and they'll be working with us to help ensure we're developing a tool and approach that is really genuinely valuable. So thank you very much for your support and that those who are um, um, volunteering and helping on that. And so on to my final slide which is setting out the roadmap from here. This is the same slide that we showed you in, um, in May and we are on track with exactly where we said we'd be announcing today on the 12th of September. Um, the next step is that the hubs will be commencing on the 1st of October and um, we'll be looking to uh, then have the MVP, the minimum viable product, up and running by the start of, um, start of 2020. And you'll see that um, coincides with the end of Milestone 1, which is for the hubs um, at the end of this year, um, 31st of December. Uh, Across those, then, there are going to be these three um, kind of strategic areas which we'll be encouraging, as Andrew mentioned at the start, across the hubs, we're encouraging them to work together on um, three key areas, uh, public um, and patient involvement and engagement, curation, and sustainability of, these of their model. So these will be worked across together, and we'll be starting today on that. So um, these are really important areas on there. So thank you so much for your support and everything to get us to here today. Um, and it's extremely exciting. We're looking forward to then meeting again at the next stage to see um, how we've achieved and what's, what's happened across there. And at this point, I'd very much like to welcome Angela, who's the um, chair of our public advisory um, board, to talk about how this is going to benefit pe um, patients and the public. Well, thanks very much, Caroline, and what an exciting program, um, and what great videos. I think Tom Hanks should be a little bit worried, actually, they're <laughs> really good. Um, I was also thrilled to see how each, in each of the videos, the issue of public trust was, was um, highlighted as being of great importance, and I wanted to say a few more words about that, because the Public Advisory Board, or PAB, which um, I and several other people in the room are, are involved with, um, is particularly concerned that um, everything that HDR UK does will, work, will have this issue of public trust at the forefront of their minds. Because we know that public trust is hard to gain, people, partly for a whole number of reasons. People really don't understand uh, data, this kind of research. It's not something that if you stop somebody in the street, they'll necessarily have thought much about. And if they have, uh, they may not have a very good understanding of it. It's highly technical. Um, but we also know that people uh, are concerned, are worried about use of their data if they don't know how it's going to be used or what for. So in our work with the, with the hubs and with all the other things that HDR UK does, we've been invited to be involved in, in, in a very direct way. So um, two of our members, Margaret and Sarah, uh, here in the front, um, read all the applications, all the hub applications, and I believe the sandbox ones as well, uh, over the summer during the, the holiday period, um, and were involved in, in the selection. And that's um, just an example of the kinds of things we do in the, in the pub, as we call ourselves. Um, but this issue of public trust is, is uh, an even bigger issue for us. Um, so as well as taking time and effort to earn, we know it can be lost very quickly. Um, and anybody who, who uh, makes a wrong step, a misstep, can quite easily end up uh, in headlines in, in the press um, with, with lots of concerns about how people's data are being used. And I think in thinking about this, we, we've, we, we believe there are three key lessons that we hope you'll all keep in mind. Firstly, transparency. Transparency is crucial. People are suspicious of things they don't understand or, or don't know. Um, and there is no reason to keep secrets in this area. 
Um, one, uh, one idea I had, which I think, I hope that you'll take on board if you're involved in a hub, is keeping uh, audit trails of the requests for data that you receive and making those available so people know who wants to use data and for what purpose. I hope all the research that's been done will be published. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a fairly controversial issue, I know, but um, it seems to me that uh, there, are, there are no good reasons for not publishing research, especially if it's done with public money. Um, we have to be always mindful of the um, data governments, governance rules and, and security has to be at the forefront, and I know you're all uh, very well aware of that. Um, but that needs to involve external uh, scrutiny as well as uh, just those, uh, those people involving data and indeed public scrutiny. It must be open to public scrutiny. Um, the um, second issue is clarity, clarity of expression. Because you're working in highly technical areas with a mass of jargon, um, it takes an even greater effort than normal to make this clear to the people whose data you're going to be using, all of us. Um, and so I think, um, and, and uh, I'm an ex-academic, so I think I can say this. Academics, this doesn't come naturally to all of us. Um, <laughs> So I do think that it must mean working with patients, members of the public, to, to craft good, clear communications, thinking about innovative ways to communicate. Um, I, uh, one of our members shared a, a really interesting example the other day, which was from an American study into, uh, some of you will have seen the headlines, into the... Uh, the the um, behavioral or the genetic basis for sexual behavior, which came, hit the headlines a, a few weeks ago, what they did was they worked with a patient group to uh, think about how best to communicate this to the public. And they did a really nice video and a really clear, clear uh, website, um, which, which they crafted jointly with the, with the LBTQ groups that they had involved. <laughs> it was a terrific example. Um, and I'm sure that many of you know of other good examples, but getting that right, the clear communications, the media strategy, the working together with patient groups is, is going to be key, I think. And the third really key issue is involvement. As you saw, um, the hubs that were successful all have patient and public involvement. That's crucial. And it has to be ongoing. It's not a matter of just uh, asking people at the beginning or at the end of, of, of a piece of work to, to you know, or telling them what you've done. It's much more than that. It means involving um, people in determining priorities. Uh, involving in the research, uh, involving individuals in thinking about what kind of outcomes are crucial to, to uh, measure, um, involving them in the design of studies, um, it, thinking about um, how uh, you're going to disseminate the results and how you're going to translate it into action. All of that needs to be done with the people whose data you're going to be using. But above all, I think, the message from, from the PAB is think about public benefit. We know that the public will support this, as you saw from those examples, if they can see very clearly what you're doing, how you're doing it, and how the public will benefit. Um, and if you can communicate that well, then I think you'll retain the trust of the public and this research will deliver all those fantastic benefits that have just been talked about. Thank you. Okay, um, so congratulations, it's 9.45. I think we've got 30 minutes for, uh, to get to know each other, basically. But can I just echo Angela's three points? Transparency, involvement, and focus on why we're doing this and how it's going to help humankind. I think that's a very good message that should resonate through the program. So thank you, Angela, I thought that was... Uh, just, 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 just great. So we, uh, as ever, we're, we're launching a website, we're uh, launching the hubs, we're uh, celebrating the sandbox. Um, there's a lot happening. 
and Caroline is going to explain it all to me and you. <laughs> so. So it's, it's very straightforward. So we've got um, until um, 10.20, uh, coffee and a chance to kind of get to know each other and meet from that point of view. Then there's um, two separate rooms which we're going to have, um, the because no one's had a chance to meet each other properly and to have a discussion from the sandbox and from the hubs. So we'll be having in um, the, at 10.20, uh, people are in the sandbox be going into the Lister room and people who are in the hubs be going to the Fleming um, room and we'll have a chance just to kind of talk together about how the plan on things will work forward um, going from there. And then at 11 o'clock we'll be back in this room and the um, sprint programme will be starting from that stage. So everyone who's um, uh, um, involved in that and, and keen to be um, join us at that stage, please do come back here at that point. Um, but on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for coming here today and um, we'll be looking forward to the next exciting step. So thank you. Thank you.